Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure of, uh, of a crew of gentlemen from Guatemala City that are doing research on or actually constructing a 3D printed uh, prosthetic uh, hand. Uh, it's headed by a Ali Lenis, uh, Carlos de la Cruz, and, and Julio Fajardo. Uh, what uh, Ali is going to do, he's going to basically uh, go over the history of his team getting together, the history of his work, and kind of go through uh, the work he's doing, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. So, uh, welcome, uh, bienvenidos, Ali. Gracias. Oh, so yeah, uh, we're based on Guatemala City. Uh, we're university at the Galileo University. I'm actually a lecturer here. So um, it started with an idea. We saw this video of 3D printed prosthetic hands, and we thought it was so so cool. I think I, yeah, this is this is one of the prototypes where uh, this is called the Robo Hand. This is a snap inversion. So we saw this video where some young kids that didn't have fingers were actually using this. 3D printed hand. Yeah. Okay. To you know, get some feedback. Okay. So uh, we saw that they were using uh, these these 3D printed hand in order to to grab objects with their hands. So um, let me see. Okay. So what we started to do was we we wanted to do that. So in, in order to do that. Um, we we went we went out and we thought about printing it ourselves and everything, but then we noticed that it, this this prosthetic hand was just for ch for children that didn't have fingers, and it's not very common that you cut all your fingers and just have the palm of your hand. I mean, there's a special disease that has that, but it's not so common. And if people like w with finger amputees, they would sometimes slice one of the fingers and they just kept on living like that. So. Um, we noticed that in Guatemala the real problem was with people that didn't have the whole hand. And they were the people that were really interested in having uh, an, an artificial limb. So that's where we said, okay, let's extend the work that they that those guys, guys are doing. And also there, there's this other project called the InMove um, Robot. So we kind of like joined those two movements and started to build our own. And right now we are at a point where I'm going to share my screen here so I can show you some of the pictures. Um, Ali, can you move your camera up a little bit? So I'm just getting the top part of your okay. head. Okay. So okay. A little bit. I'm sorry to interrupt. But, uh, there. Uh, yeah. Oh, so maybe right now I'm gonna be sharing yeah, my screen. The screen sharing is kind of strange. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. Sorry about that. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay in a while. Okay. So uh, this is the patient. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. So uh, this is the patient that that is that. He's an ex-soldier in Guatemala, so one of the things also is we spoke with various people that were working on prosthetics here in Guatemala, and they recommended that we shouldn't start with children because maybe we weren't very sure of, of what the technology was. So uh, that's why they recommended something, uh, someone from the army. So this is an ex-soldier who, who lost his arm uh, in combat, and he's been a prosthetic user for around 20 years. So he knows about prosthetics and what to expect from them. So uh, we designed. Um, so here you have another image of, of how he looks. Okay. And then um, here we're we're working with with a, a prosthetist from the um, from the army actually. So he's helping us, you know, uh, because we're not experts on that area. So here we're taking some measurements and, and adapting the the hand. This is the three D printed hand. You can see it here. So okay. um, I'm gonna and also also on, on this image. Let me see if this comes out. Okay. Yeah, also, on this image, you can see that there is uh, this is actually a bicycle cable. So one of the first things that we wanted to do was we wanted to it to be very very simple. I mean, uh, and very reliable. So this has it's very simple. It, it doesn't have many flaws. So we wanted we wanted reliability and low cost. So this is under fifty dollars. The hand is three D printed. So the stump goes inside this uh, kind of a globe. I'm, I'm not sure what it's called. I don't know. You know. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure what what this case is called. Uh, this brown. Okay. Thing. So, so that's where he puts his stump. And maybe I can I can show you one of the videos he's actually using it. Um, okay. We'll try it. Oh. 
Yeah, okay. Here, here he's grabbing a, a, a cup. Um, well, there's some videos of him using it. I, I, I have one here. Um, okay. Yeah, I can't guarantee it's going to work, but we'll try it. Yeah, we can try it. So there you can see that he's, by, by using the, his shoulder, he's opening and closing the hand. And with this movement of opening and closing the hand, he can like uh, drive a bicycle, drive a car. He can carry a toolbox, for example. I think I have a video where he's carrying a toolbox. There. The, uh, here he's carrying a toolbox. And then we ask him, um, can you put the toolbox down? So here he's, uh, the toolbox is full of tools. So it, it can support uh, a pretty fair amount of, of weight. And then he lets go. And that's done with the movement of the shoulder. So uh, right now he's starting to evaluate this, um, this mechanical prosthetic hand. And we're also working on the new version, which the new where we want to do the bionic version. So in this video that I'm showing here, uh, Carlos is has some sensors attached to his muscles, and you can see that he has some headphones. So he speaks to the he headphones. Actually, he he contracts his muscles to make the the computer that that opens and closes the hand. It, like he tells him, okay, pay attention. So then he gives the command with his voice. For example, there he said point, and then the, the, the hand pointed. Now he says rock, and the hand does kind of like the rock sign. So um, it's voice control, but you activate it and you confirm it with your muscles. So we want to do this. That's incredible technology. Yeah. Uh, we, can we stop there for, just for a second? Because I really want to understand that. That's very important. So it's voice command that actually moves the fingers? Exactly. So um, one of the things is, when when he when he moves his muscles, that okay. gives the signal to the computer that okay. it, it tells that the computer exactly exactly. It, it, it kind of okay. means pay attention. I'm going to give you oh, a command. Oh, okay, that's a good point. Uh huh. And then and then he issues the command with his voice, <clears throat> and then the computer uh, understands. It has an artificial intelligence inside the computer, so the computer intelligence that displays on a small screen. It says, okay, you want to point, and if that's what you really want to do, then you you. Uh, strengthening your muscles again. You tighten your muscles again so that okay. the computer receives the confirmation signal. So then it executes that signal. The idea of this was um, right now they have the Google Glass and if somebody else, for example, says, okay, take a picture, and then the, gla the glass might take a picture even though you're not giving it the command. So what we wanted to do is have a personal, uh, like uh, something that only you can give the command to, to, to execute the action. So um, this is this is kind of where we are now. We are working on the bionic version, and right now the soldier is starting to use uh, the mechanical version. We kind of want him to get used to um, using the hand, the, the the mechanical version. And once he once he gets comfortable with it, then we want to upgrade it to the bionic version. And the idea of this is we want it to be really low cost, and all this is open source and open hardware. So we're gonna. We're sharing all our findings, and if people want to contribute, uh, I mean, with technology or, or, or with testing, it's, it's, it's open for everyone, you know. Uh, so right now, this, this mechanical version is under $50, and the bionic version, we hope it's going to be under $150, and we're, that's kind of like where we want to set our limits. It's fantastic. Uh, is he happy? Is the soldier happy? Well, um, we just started using it, so we had the first session where we put it on. He actually has. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the um, to to display my my face there. Uh, so he actually has two two of these. So right now he's using. Sometimes he's like we said. Okay, right now at the beginning you can start by using ours for some hours and then yours for other hours. And then we're gonna have a meeting next week. Uh, so he can tell us how he's been feeling, and then uh, I'm I'm guessing that we're gonna be doing some upgrades and some updates to to some of the things. So that's why we're thinking about two or three months for him getting used to this first part. He's uh, he actually he has kind of like a hook. It's not a hook. Uh, I'm not sure how you call this. It just open uh, like a claw. Just opens and closes. Metallic claw. It's, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so um, right now... Uh, that's using... one of the most important functions of the hand. It's called prehension. Exactly. Prehension. Uh, yeah. That's why the hand is so important. You can put fingers... You can oppose the fingers. That's mm -hmm. why it's very important to have a hand. 
Yeah, exactly. So right now, uh, we kind of get want to get it to the point where he feels more comfortable with using our version of the hand instead of the one that he has. But he uh, he like he can just switch it anytime. So we're working on, on the mechanical part in order to get it working for an everyday basis. And when that time comes, then we're going to do the upgrade to the to the bionic version. So that's a little bit where we stand right now. Oh, that's that's fantastic. You know, I got so many questions, and I'm sure that if we had other panelists, we have a lot of questions. But you know, why don't we start at the at the very beginning? Now, you guys, uh, you got you guys kind of met uh, at the university. You're you're a teacher, correct? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm a lecturer at the university, and when we heard about this project, we said, okay, this is so cool. We want to do this, and we actually started very complicated. So. Uh, here, for example, we had some technology that we actually wanted to. It's, some people uh, ask us why did we start with this project, and I think it's really just because we thought we could we could do it. I mean, we thought we were able to do it, and that was going to be something fun to do, um, and, and something that we could actually help enhance because we saw that the the things that were right now there, we thought we could improve some stuff. So we started with with these kind of. Um, very comp uh, I don't know very complicated things. This is a uh, an uh, EEG. Okay. So this is kind of like a headset that does EEG, right? So it reads your brain waves. Okay. And so we started with this, and what we would do is we would put this headset on, and then we would control stuff with our minds. So I think I have a video around here. I'm gonna. Maybe I'm going to share my screen and, and, and show it to you. So. Okay. Well, be, uh, be careful. It's, it's sometimes temperamental. Okay, okay. Let's hope it works. Okay. So, there we go. I hope we're going there. Um, okay. So far, so good. Hope, hope it works. Let's see. So, yeah. Uh, on this video, for example, you can see that... Um, here I'm using this, I'm controlling this, here I have the headset, and I can raise this just with with thinking about it. You're um, well, you're doing that yeah. with a headset. Yes, the headset. So so I, I had some pre-configured kind of like thoughts, and then and then I would try to execute them. And here I'm using some very interesting um, material. This, this is being pulled by something called a muscle wire, which is basically um, kind of like a thin cable, metallic cable, okay. and we started, it sounded so cool, like muscle wire, so we wanted to use that technology, but we kind of noticed that it was very hard to use. So uh, there I'm doing other actions, because here, I, like, I had configured some sounds and some other stuff. Uh, I could turn on lights, but um, we noticed that, maybe I'm looking for another part, okay, yeah. So um, we started like that, but we noticed it wasn't very reliable. I'm going to switch back here. So we noticed it wasn't very reliable, and then we kind of went from from the very complex, high-end, like muscle wire, uh, reading your thoughts, neural network things. Um, we kind of went like to the lowest level, just mechanical version, because one of the problems with thought is that people get distracted very easily. So right. we we were, you know, we had to be very concentrated in order to get things to work the way you wanted to, and one or two actions were kind of Hard. Even even one action was a little. One action is pretty easy because you just like relax or think about that one action. But once you get like to four different thoughts, it gets very very complicated. And then just I don't know something. A bee flies by, and then you get distracted, and the hand would start doing all this crazy stuff. So um, that's where we thought that we wanted to start with a mechanical version, very reliable. If it breaks, they can fix it themselves. Uh, very cheap. And then kind of like put the complexity on the electronics. So for the electronics we're using, uh, so that's where we, that's kind of when we got together. So we thought uh, we needed one computer science guy, which is me. And, and I also, um, I, my master's is on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then uh, we got the guy from electronics, who is Julio Fajardo, he's coming back right now. Mm -hmm. And then Carlos, which you can see at the, at the other screen. Okay. Uh, so, um, Carlos, he's doing the mechanical parts, and and Fajardo is doing the electronics. Incredible! You know, one part. Um, there's a million questions, man. Uh, the part, the part that I'm I'm kind of curious about is the part from the thought 
to the action. You know, can you can you go through that again? I don't know if I understand it. In other words, you you have to lift when you, for example, lift the arm, lift the arm. You have mm -hmm. to keep saying that to yourself when you're thinking, or is it just you don't say say it out loud? You just kind of think it. How? Well, um, uh, it, it actually it, it works two ways. Uh, one of the ways is you can actually, uh, for example, you can configure it that if you wink, then the wink means to point, for example. Okay. Or you can um, bite. So when you clench your teeth, that might mean something because people that do EEG, they know, they, they can recognize all those patterns, you know, a wink or, or they, when they're looking at their screen, they say, okay, here he winked. Here okay. he's clenching his teeth. So you can use those or you can just use like your thoughts. So what you do is you train um, an artificial intelligence. You train it to some action. So you say, okay, right now I'm going to not think about anything. So you just right. don't think about anything and that's your baseline. Okay. And then you say, okay, now I'm going to think about closing the hand. So you just start to concentrate on what you feel uh, is closing a hand. And when you do that, the computer actually learns and says, okay, so this was the baseline. And this is how he thinks about closing the hand. So he stores it. And then you repeat that a few times until the AI says, okay, okay so, so this is what it means to, 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 to close the hand. And yeah, that's, that's basically how it works. It's not very reliable, and that's why we stopped using that. It's kind of like a nice game, but not, not, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. Uh, do, you, do you have to build up a, like a database of thoughts, like if you think, uh, one, exactly. One, yes, you exactly. Program it for that. You think two of the program it. Is it kind of like that? Yeah. Um. It, there's no actual programming in the sense of computer science programming. It's more. Uh. It, it learns by example. So, for example, you tell it, okay, now I'm going to think about closing the hand. So you kind of press a button and say, okay, now I'm going to start thinking about pressing the hand. And you start thinking about that, and it gives you, I don't know, five seconds to think about that. And then you do that around 30 times so that he can establish a mental pattern. And then he can distinguish between not thinking about anything, which is just relaxing, or thinking about closing your hand. And actually, um, th that means one action, right? That means not doing nothing, not doing, yeah, or doing one thing, which is maybe closing the hand. So uh, that's, that's pretty easy and very reliable, actually. But once you get to more actions, then it's where it starts to get complicated. But yeah, it learns by example. You don't have to do any computer programming. Just you know, show him by example what what are your thought patterns really. Well, you know, uh, Ali, how did you meet John Scholl and, and that fantastic community, e e maker? How did you run into those guys? Well, um. Actually, when, when we first heard about this project, there were two people that were mainly like the leaders of this. Uh, it was Ivan Owen, who had designed the, the robo hand, which is this hand, right? So Ivan Owen had designed this one, and Richard Van Ass was the guy who, who didn't have the fingers. So they kind of developed the robo hand project, which is that one. But then uh, robo hand kind of went closed source, so now they made a company, and they're working as a company to keep on that, and so Ivan Owen, who was the designer, I, I, I think John Schull, um he kind of like got in, got in touch, and then they made this fantastic community called Enable, and they're kind of like keep they kept it open source, and there's a lot of people involved. So right now that we went to the Maker Fair, I mean we had heard of those guys, but um, we we're kind of like inside our our own uh, lab in the computer uh, in the computer lab working by ourselves and right now that we went to the Maker Fair and we presented our, our, our ideas, uh, they were neighbors at the Maker Fair so that's where we kind of like really got into talking and then right now we joined the community that they, that they have and yeah right now we're sharing all our ideas and I think there are two main communities that are working on this right now and one is the Enable community and the other one is the InMove project which is actually that's um, can you, uh, spell the, that? Can, you put that, can you put that in the chat in case I want to look yeah. it up? The E, uh, Nable, and the... I know, I got the E, Nable. I got that one. Yeah, and the InMove project. So, uh, the InMove project... Yeah, yeah. The, the InMove is actually um, a 3D printed robot. It's super cool. Um, 
But one of the like the spin-offs of InMove is is doing uh, a prosthetic ha hand or arm, uh, because one of the things that um, ena Enable is basically right now concentrated on people that don't have fingers but do have the palm of their hand. So um, that wasn't the case for us. We wanted like a full hand prosthetic, so that's why we started to develop this other hand. And it's basically a mixture between the InMove and the Enable project. And I mean, of course, we've spiced up some other stuff, right? So uh, we we actually had to redesign most of the parts. But yeah, that that's a little bit where we are also right now. Well, just a question uh, briefly, Ali, about the uh, e-make. Uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, Maker Fair, uh, mm -hmm. because that was I've never heard of that. I didn't really know about it, um, and it was in the Embarcadero part of San Francisco, correct? Uh, in in San Mateo. It was in San Mateo. Oh, okay. Um, and it was a huge hall with a lot of projects going on. Exactly. I think I think the amount of people that that went this year was like 120,000 people. So it was it was huge. It was a lot of people. I think there were over 5,000 makers there. Uh, so it's basically actually I was reading right now uh, recently the difference between a hacker space, a maker space, a fab lab, which is a lot of the new emerging technologies and one of the things was for hackers hackers wanted to build things so that's like internet communities they were open source so the internet is free nobody's the owner of the internet the the protocols that that are around the internet they're all open source and i think all that spirit of the internet was kind of overflowing and it reached the communities so but the, the word hacker it still kind of it has this bad connotation of you know somebody stealing your software and that kind of yeah screwing up stuff. your computer. So that's why they yeah yeah so actually I think that's why they went for the word maker which actually means somebody that wants to build something right. so the maker movement right now is I think it's becoming a very important movement actually President um, Obama I think last week maybe or this week. He said like a call for makers and, and inviting governors or or mayors to join and to create maker fairs and maker spaces because one of the ideas is that a lot of the projects and products are going to be coming out of these uh, technologies. Also as an educator, we are having right now some problems in getting the kids motivated into school. Um, so one of the things that's happening is that when you actually show them and build stuff and, and like Show them how to build stuff. They they get interested in the technologies and and in the mathematics or physics or all the STEM education. They get interested in that. So yeah, I think that's why the U.S. government is now really like trying to incentivate these kind of things. But yeah, that's what the Maker Fair is about. It's about bringing a lot of people that want to you know do it yourself or build products or work with their, with their hands and and actually build things right. Well, you know, it's kind of two technologies that are kind of growing together, and they're helping each other because Hangouts and G Plus and 3D printing all kind of work together. You know, uh, the Hangouts uh, can bring us together right now when we're talking, and also I hope you get to use them with your your people that you collaborate on your projects with because it's a definite, uh, definitely good tech to use. But also you have the um, uh, the creation of G plus communities, which brings people, like you mentioned, together, brings engineers, open source from all over the place that can contribute to very useful technologies, can contribute to the furtherance of the three D printing world and the prosthetics world, and this, and, and this actually, Ali, can be applied to other areas of medicine where you have a problem, like you have a problem. Of, of a lack of a, of a hand, which is a problem, and you, you get together, you collaborate on the internet from other from all parts of the world. I saw I saw on e, on eMaker there were engineers from all over the world. It wasn't just America. There were as, and you can attest to that. There were engineers from Europe, from Australia. Yeah, we're from Guatemala. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. There's there's no borders. I mean. It, it's like they were next door helping you out. Of course, it'd be better for them to be there, but they were able to, you know, communicate pretty effectively to to build things, which is incredible. Yes, actually, uh, for us, I, once I was talking with uh, with another lecturer here in Guatemala, 
and we were discussing what, what we were teaching and and then he told me, oh, you know, I used to teach like 20 years ago, I used to teach this thing. And I think I wasn't very impressed when he told me what he was teaching. And then he told me, but you have to remember there was no internet at that time. And actually what the internet has done is that it's it's like there it's a place, cyberspace is a place where there's no limits of space. I mean, we, we are collaborating right now with the Maker Faire. Also, we met uh, Bionico, who is this guy in France who doesn't have a hand, so he's using all this technology and we're, now we're starting to collaborate with him, although he's in France, and the people from Enable, are, a lot of them are in the US, and we're in Guatemala, and it's, I mean, it's very easy to collaborate through Hangouts. Yesterday we had a Hangout where we're, we were discussing ideas, and you, if, if a new technology comes out in the US or in the UK, we have instant access to that, so we don't have to wait, you know, a few years for the technology to come. We just search on the internet and it's there. And so the communities are becoming global. I think this is kind of like the, and some people describe the maker movement like that. It's kind of like the, the internet meets the real world. And right now there's a lot of talk about the internet of things, for example. Um, and, and I think like more devices are getting connected. Uh, a lot of the medical stuff is being, here at the university there's this other um, uh, student that that did some mobile app that if you put kind of like a, it's, um, it's I don't remember the name, what girls use on their ears, I don't remember how that's mm -hmm. called, earrings, yeah, kind of like if you use this special earring then that, that I think that's going to like measure if you have diabetes and then it's going to send some signals to your, mo to your mobile phone and then that's going to upload it and then your, your, that's going to be the killer app. Whoever figures out how to non-invasively measure diabetes, that's going to be a killer app. Whoever, yeah, but, whoever gets that down. Yeah, I think right now there are some sensors that that it's not a pretty earring. It's kind of like bulky, ugly thing right now. But but I mean, people are getting there, um, and people are collaborating. And for example, the the Arduino platform, which is right now a lot of people are using it. Uh, that was made in Italy, and so I think there's not a lot of borders of where the innovation can come up, and collaboration is really starting to to help everyone. So yeah, I think these, these are also, for example, the Google Docs or Google Drive that allow for everybody everywhere to collaborate on the same document. We're using those technologies a lot, so yeah, it's been for us also great. Well, you know, I saw that I saw it, I've heard of Google Drive, but I saw it for the first time today. Uh, that, that's an incredible technology. You know, what, what we're doing, we're doing in a couple of uh, weeks, uh, Ali, and, and maybe you can even participate. We're, we're, we're basically televising a conference in uh, Indianapolis on Google Glass. And I know you mentioned it once in your presentation, but what, what we're doing is we're illustrating two of the points that you mentioned about the Internet. It cuts out the, the, the uh, impediment of distance, it takes it out and also it, it helps for time constraints. A lot of, it, get, it can get people together that are really, really busy because most scientists are probably like you, they're very, very, very busy. They don't have a week to go up to San Francisco, they don't have a week to go up to, to conferences, but they have an hour to get together on a hangout with something like this. So it, it really helps with the time problem with a lot of busy people. So now, now one point of thing, you mentioned, I'm very curious to hear, you mentioned Google Glass. Can you go over that, uh, where, where, how it affects uh, what you're doing? Uh, well, Google Glass is one of the um, um, kind of like wear-ons, like wearable technologies. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of Google Glass myself. I think it's a very interesting piece of technology, and actually, there's there's other very interesting uh, things. For example, there are these contact lenses that you can put them inside your like a contact lens, and what happens is you get a, an LCD screen, and that one also measures like your diabetes, um, your sugar levels. I'm not sure if that's correct, um, and, and then it can transmit it to a to a like a local thing. So I think Google Glass is one of the one of the things that's happening with wearables. It's an interesting technology. Um, 
I'm not a big fan. We have some of those here to to play but with. You, you mentioned you mentioned uh, Ellie about about how you, it can be used with your hand doing something. Did you? Yeah, make, it's, did yeah, I, exactly. Uh, um, I mean, because since since it's wearable and it has a computer, so one of the things, for example, if you have a, a bionic prosthesis, uh, then it can tell you, for example, the level of your battery, or or when um, where we're doing giving it commands, for example, open and close and point, then the, the command could appear on your Google Glass so that you can say the word. So, uh, for example, pointing. So you say point, and then you, you, when you see it there, you can confirm it automatically with your, with your um, arm, right, with your muscles. Okay. So I think that those are some uses for the technology. Uh, it's still kind of trying to find its way. A lot. Of, I mean, right now the apps are starting to come out, so we're going to see what what it, what it becomes, right? Well, I, I hope we're going to televise the conference, and actually we're going to have hangouts before. So, uh, and actually we had some some hand surgeons that I would like to get together with you. Um, that you know, that's their business is the hand, and I'm sure they'd have a lot of questions for you. Um, I don't know if they deal with people that are, you know, have congenital problems, but I mean, they know the mechanics of the hand. They know what's needed. They know how certain things are difficult to do. And so they, you guys might have some really good discussions. And I'll try to get you guys together with hand versions. So uh, uh, I think I think that'll be a, a good a good hangout. So okay, um, what's what's the next step? Uh, what do you plan for in the near future? Okay, so uh, right now for us, the next steps would be um, actually get the mechanical version working much better. So our, our idea is that in about three months, our first patient is going to feel very comfortable with that mechanical version, and he's going to like really prefer it um, amongst other options that he has right now. And if that works out properly, then we just plan to open source it and give it away for, for free for the people. So. Anybody that wants to use it just has to download it and build it themselves. Uh, so that's that for the mechanical part. And then after that, we start testing the bionic version. And also, if the bionic version works out well, then also open source it and give it away for free. But we do kind of want to do at first some close testing just to see what it really does and what it doesn't do, so that we don't, you know, promise things that are not really that. So yeah. That, I think that's that's where we, we will be going in the near future. Okay, we'll be following you. Now, Ali, going back to the Maker Fair, did you have any private uh, investors talking to you, thinking about marketing, thinking about you know, collaborating with you, or is it pretty well people who are just interested in the tech? Well, uh, I think we were, uh, it was our first time at a Maker Fair, so I think we weren't very sure what to expect from it. And we kind of thought we were just going to display our stuff. And actually, there was a lot of people that was interested in giving us funding or, or you know, learning more about the project or actually making it a company. So some people just wanted to give donations. Other people wanted to see if we had thought about the marketing strategy and all of that. Uh, I think we weren't prepared for that. And right now, we kind of want to concentrate on the product, on, on getting it to work. And maybe if it works, then later we can start thinking of, OK, what, what can we do? With this, but yeah. I think right now our focus is going to be on finishing it and making it work properly. But yes, we were very impressed on the amount of people that were interested in these kind of technologies. We we didn't think it was going to be like that. We, we I don't know. We didn't think much about it. So we well, were you know, It's only going to increase, and I know that you know that it's very solid in Europe. Europe, the three D printing uh, world is is very big. Uh, were there many Europeans at the Maker Fair, or was it mostly Americans? I think mostly Americans, uh, but it, I mean it was in San Francisco, so yeah. I would expect that. Um, we did meet some some Europeans and some Latin Americans. There were a lot of Latin Americans too. Maybe also because since we were from Latin America, people would say, you know, I'm also from from Latin America, so that might be biased, but yeah. It was very international too. Okay, uh, just a few questions, Ali. Did you start with computers very young, or is it something you picked up later in life? Well, uh, for for me, I'm I'm 36 year, years old right now, so I actually started when I was 17, which was uh, I don't know when computers kind of like became cheaper. So I started with a 386, um, and I just fell in love with the computers, and I, it's been a great love story for me. Um, 
uh, I guess for the, for these kids that are younger, they they maybe they started computers much more younger. I'm not sure. Yeah. How old? Why don't we meet the uh, Julio and uh, Carlos? Yeah. So here, here wow. maybe I I no, started no. maybe when I was. Uh, Can you move, Carlos? I can't see you in the camera. Okay. So, so th this is gonna be Julio speaking right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Maybe I was started when I was uh, um, twenty years old. Maybe. Um, Carlos. I, I, uh, well, hi. Uh, I am Carlos, and I started studying mechatronic engineer like when I was seventeen. Okay. And right now I have twenty-three years old, so that's my my age. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I guess the three of us started pretty late on the game, but yeah. And you're still teaching, Ali? Yes, yes. Uh, I teach computer science uh, at this at this uh, the Galileo University, and these guys are collaborating some of the um, in other courses. So uh, they are mostly TAs right now. Oh, both of them. Well, well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for the time and your presentation. And you know, uh, I'm certainly we'll do more of these, and and you know, let us know, uh, Ali. Uh, what you're up to, and if there's any new developments you'd like to publicize or talk about, or, or reach out to people. I'm sure you, you probably know how to do that, anyways. You don't need our help, but uh, uh, we'll certainly be posting stuff that you guys are doing because you're doing wonderful work, and it, it impacts. You know, not 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 only am I impressed by the 3D movement, but I'm impressed by the way the community it works in this particular instance in medicine. In this area of healthcare, how you all you guys are collaborating and crowdsourcing. You hear about you hear the word crowdsourcing, but you guys really make it work you know, in that community. You make it you make the collective intelligence uh, work to to pu push forward the uh, science of prosthetics. So I thank you guys. Hold on now, I'm gonna cut the video and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, good night everybody. Thank you.